Hi, welcome to the last section of Chapter 12 here on the American Pageant. We're doing Section 3 here, uh, covering the uneasy Missouri Compromise to Monroe's Doctrine. So you got a balance of power in Congress. Uh, the Senate is pretty equal between slave states and free states. Uh, this is the era of good feelings. There's really no political parties. And yet there's a little problem with Missouri. Missouri applied for statehood. Uh, and they would upset this balance. Henry Clay, who's known as the Great Compromiser, the man from Kentucky, famous for his American system, he also invented the mint julep, supposedly, uh, introduced a compromise um, to, to decide whether or not Missouri would be admitted as a slave state. Congress had finally admitted to, uh, to allowed to admit Missouri as a slave state in 1820, uh, partly because Maine, which was once a part of Massachusetts, was also going to be admitted at the same time as a separate free state. So you got a free state, you got a slave state, balance is still maintained. And to plan for future problems, um, Congress forbade slavery in the remaining territories of the Louisiana Territory north of the 3630 line, except for Missouri. So the very southern border of Missouri, except a little taily thing that hangs down like a little mullet of Missouri, Everything, if you extend that in the Louisiana Purchase, which actually just goes to the Rocky Mountains, slavery was banned north of it, it was allowed south of it, and everyone patted themselves on the back because they avoided controversy, they avoided, um, you know, going to blows over this issue of slavery, and balance of power was, mis uh, was maintained. Good job, Henry Clay. So here's a little line, you can see the 3630 line. Uh, Missouri was admitted as a, free, a slave state, uh, and then Maine is a free state. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the other stuff here in a little bit. So John Marshall and the judicial nationalism. Um, John Marshall served as the chief justice for 34 years, nominated by John, John Adams. Uh, the federal government grew in power because of the Marshall Court. Uh, his rulings increased the power of the federal government. You have McCulloch versus Maryland in 1819 in which Marshall declared the U.S. Bank constitutional by invoking the Hamiltonian doctrine of implied powers. So the Federalists, even though they are gone, their legacy was continuing on with John Marshall because Supreme Court justices served for life. Federalists believed in that loose interpretation of the Constitution or a loose construction. The Republicans, except for when they had a real estate deal, believed in a strict interpretation. Uh, the bank, which was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court, Marshall ruled that yes, you can if if it's not explicitly banned in the Constitution, Congress can do this because of the necessary and proper clause, or as we call it, the elastic clause. Now, he strengthened the federal authority when he denied the right to Maryland to tax the bank. Maryland basically was trying to tax it, and then he said no, that's not okay. In Cohen's versus Virginia in 1821, Marshall ruled the Supreme Court could review the decisions of state Supreme Courts that basically the Supreme Court was the supreme law of the land. And hey, the name fits. Uh, and that basically their decisions were binding for lower courts. They could overrule the lower courts. Uh, and so once again, the, the federal government is becoming more powerful versus all these little state governments. In Gibbons versus Ogden in 1824, he and the court ruled that uh, the only the federal government had jurisdiction over interstate commerce after New York tried to regulate it. So interstate commerce is between, say, New York and Pennsylvania. New York tried to regulate that interstate, not intra, but interstate commerce. He ruled the federal government had the sole power to do that, once again further strengthening the federal government. Uh, judicial dikes against democratic excesses. You have more of these. Fletcher versus Peck in 1810. The Georgia legislature granted 35 million acres to private speculators, uh, the next legislative uh, legislative group canceled the bribery-induced transaction. Uh, John Marshall let the state give the acres to the private speculators, calling it a con contract and constitutional. It could not be voided by the next uh, legislature. The decision protected property rights against popular pressures uh, and strengthened, so it wasn't just the federal government, but it strengthened kind of the, you know, the whims of the people. Dartmouth College versus Woodward in 1819. Uh, Dartmouth was actually given this charter by King George III, but New Hampshire wanted to take it away. Their charter, Marshall ruled in favor of the college and said the college has been operating, it's been there, uh, just because you didn't like it because it was over the king. You know what? Let it operate. Daniel Webster, who's pictured here, was an expounding father, served in both the House and the Senate, uh, shared a sillier view of states' rights, 
uh, in federal power with Marshall. Not sure why it says sillier. That might be a typo. <laughs> Sorry. Let's pause for a second. Sorry, got the typo fix there. He uh, believed in similar views, not sillier. That was silly what I did there. I am sorry for the typo. I guess nobody's perfect. Uh, similar view of states' rights and the federal power with Marshall. Uh, Webster was an expounding father. If, if uh, What the book says is if Marshall was a, a founding father or a molding father of the Constitution, this was an expounding father, which is just a fancy way to say that they're in cohorts, that he came down from the Senate chamber, discussed things with Marshall, uh, and they strengthened the federal government, which they saw as a protector against the whims of popular, popularly elected state governments, which is uh, the whims of the people. Uh, so here's Daniel Webster, a stat statue of him in actually Central Park. Uh, he's originally from New Hampshire and kind of bounced around New England, fond of drink and good food, may have hurt his chances, but he was a, a man who believed in liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable, is the quote that he said. Uh, Oregon and inquiring Florida. John Quincy Adams is our Secretary of State to James Monroe. At that point, that was the job as a stepping stone to be the next president. Uh, Jefferson was Secretary of State, and he later became president. And Madison was Secretary of State president. Monroe was Secretary of State president. Adams, he's now Secretary of State for James Monroe, and he does become president. Uh, the Anglo-American Convention in 1818, which is between us and, and Britain, Americans decided to share Newfoundland fisheries with the Canadians, which that's good, more fish. Uh, it also provided a 10-year joint occupation of the Oregon country without a surrender of the rights or claims of either America or Britain. There's just really not a lot of people out there, and so we'll just kind of do it together for 10 years. You, know, you people move there, we'll move there, we'll see what happens. Let's not pick and choose who gets to own Oregon right now. Uh, with many revolutions taking place in South America, uh, Latin America really took, took um, inspiration from the American Revolution. You had people like Simon Bolivar uh, and Jose de San Martin leading revolutions in, in Latin America. You also have Mexico rebelling. Uh, and so Spain was forced to take a lot of its troops out of Florida to go fight these revolutions. Florida was left unprotected. And so General Andrew Jackson went into Florida saying he was there to punish Indians and to recapture runaway slaves. Jackson's a He's a lifelong racist, let's just be honest, uh, who are hiding in Spanish Florida, and he kind of starts a war against the Seminole tribes. Uh, he did this. He captured the forts of St. Mark's and Pensacola, who were the two, which were the two most important posts in the area. Kind of sets the groundwork that basically, we're going to take it from you. We're going to have Florida. Sorry, Spain. You can go deal with your revolutions in South America. Uh, in the Florida Purchase Treaty of 1819, Spain ceded Florida and Spanish, they gave up their claims to Oregon in exchange that we gave up our claims to Texas. Uh, often called the adams onis Treaty, uh, it also extended our land from the Louisiana Purchase all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and so officially, for the first time, America had land from sea to shining sea, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Uh, Spain, in return, received five million bucks. Uh, and we also agreed to a border to the Pacific on the 42nd parallel. That becomes the southern border of the United States, uh, the northern border of New Spain, uh, which is later the border of Mexico. And so at that point, America is a transcontinental power now. Yay, West Coast, West Side, finally in the game. Yeah, what's up? That little Northwest Territory? Yeah, the West Side, that's the best side now, fools. Uh, so you can see a little map here, the Louisiana Purchase. Um, you know, some of that stuff was a little bit hazy, New Mexico in there. Uh, but now we have joint occupation with Oregon, and we have we have land all the way to the coast, and we have Florida. We Disney World, uh, the menace of monarchy. After Napoleon's defeat in 1815, the Europeans wanted to completely eliminate democracy. Uh, at the basically at the peace treaties, um, they decided Metternich decided to get rid of democracy and let's restore all the monarchies. Um, there was rumors of a European coalition to restore the Spanish crown in Latin America. You have Russia encroaching down the Pacific coast. They establish Fort Ross in San Francisco. They control Alaska. Uh, and then you have George Canning, a British foreign secretary, uh, asked the American minister in London if the United States would band together with Britain in a joint declaration 
renouncing interest in acquiring Latin American territory. That's a lot. Specifically warning the European dictators to keep out of Latin America. And so Canning's like, hey, you know, Johnny, we should get together and say that nobody can take over Latin America. And we, let, we respect these countries from doing what they want. What do you say, America? And we went, what, do you speak English? Because we do American English now. Is that British English? Um, so you kind of see the situation here on the map. You can see Canada, which was owned by the United Kingdom or the Great Britain at that time. We have America. We have the joint occupation of, uh, of Oregon. You have Alaska by the Russians. And then you have Spain losing control of Mexico and all that stuff going on. And so Adams feared that joining the British would tie Americans' hands. And so at his urging, and, and he basically he writes this, gives it to the president and says, hey, or put your name on this, sign it. Kind of like, you know, when your kids come home, go, hey, mom, you got to sign all these papers. And you think they're just, you know, syllabus and all that. But actually, the kid got detention. You just signed it away. Adams does the same thing. President Murrow signed this. Uh, it's a doctrine. Basically, that we're not going to extend territorially. If if we're bound to what Britain wants, we can't expand the United States. And we got a lot of land to grow to. Uh, British ships would protect their trade in Latin America without an alliance anyway. We trade so much with the British. Why sign a deal with them? Then we're going to follow Washington's lead. That Basically, we're going to stay out of entanglements, out of alliances with Europe. Uh, and so Adams writes this, but it's issued to James Monroe. The Monroe Doctrine, issued in 1823, was a warning to European powers that new colonization of the Western Hemisphere was over. Uh, that this is our turf. This is West Side homies for life. You mess with them, you mess with us. This is our turf. We won't mess with your, your territories or your colonies that you have right now. But read my lips. No, no, colonies. Not in that. <laughs> Little George H.W. Bush. Uh, so it's non-colonization, non-intervention. You don't get involved over here and you don't make new colonies or you're going to answer to us. Which is ironic because we really probably couldn't, you know, I pulled our whole end of the bargain. We probably couldn't enforce it as well. I mean, could now. We've got big missiles and nukes and all that stuff. Uh, it had an immediate impact on this. Um, Monroe stated the era of colonization was over. Basically... Russia, stay out of our business. Don't be encroaching down the coast of California. All you guys looking at all the stuff in Latin America you can pick off. No, this is our side of the world. He also warned against foreign intervention so these colonies, these new uh, Latin American countries could, could win their independence against the Spanish. He warned Britain to stay out of the Western Hemisphere and say the United States could not intervene. We won't intervene in your wars either. You know what? You guys fight over there, do whatever. We're not going to get involved. We'll take care of this side, you know, let's just let's just stay in our own corner of the world. So here's Monroe issuing his doctrine with the cabinet, which is really the brainchild of John Quincy Adams. So most European powers were pretty offended by Monroe's doctrine. Uh, this was in part because of America's soft military strength. Remember in the War of 1812, we had like 5,000 troops. Napoleon had 500,000. So they kind of scoff at us. They're like, <laughs> silly America. You can't do anything, but there's this huge ocean that kind of makes it enforceable by us. Monroe was more concerned with the security of America than um, when he issued the Monroe Doctrine. He was just worried about encroaching powers threatening us, not so much as a goodwill towards Latin America, which gets kind of construed. And this is one of the more hated documents in, in modern times in Latin America because it almost gave the United States a license to meddle in what Latin America was doing. Uh, he basically warned old powers to stay away. The British ships were still protecting their trade, did more to deter European powers than the doctrine. Basically, the British, who were protecting that valuable American trade, they don't want to get involved because the British have powerful boats and guns. It's, it's not America's threats or our doctrine or our West Side homies for life. Uh, we're kind of the wannabes at that point. Uh, the doctrine, though, thrived off the nationalism, that this is America. We're proud of our federal government. We're proud of, proud of our country. We can do good things. We can do great things. And this is from the emergence of the confidence of the so-called win at the War of 1812. Uh, it influenced diplomacy into well into the next century. It's still a cog in the piece of our foreign policy in the, uh, the Cold War. Uh, some people claim we still use it today. Um, the Russo-American Treaty in 1824, the Russians gave up their claims to Oregon. They retreated further north to Alaska. Which is good because, you know, Sarah Palin eventually could see Russia from her door. So that's what's going on there. Here's a, a chronological order of what happened in this chapter. 
Uh, here's some practice questions if you want to answer those and, and see some, uh, see how you do. If you have any questions or comments, put them in the comments. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. Have a good evening.